Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. If you're here or you're online, welcome to our service today. It feels weird to see the church a little less full than last week, because last week was quite busy. Um, but it's nice to stand in front of you without crying, so I'll promise I won't do that today. Um, let's just pray together before we start our service. Dear God, we honor you with everything that we have. We praise you, and we lift your name on high. Please be honoured by this service today. We ask in your name. Amen. We are very excited to start with our new series today called 10. I wonder if anyone can guess what it's about? No? No one? <laughs> we'll have to wait for Ian then. Um, we are very excited about our new series, and we're looking forward to see what God's going to do in this next few weeks. I saw this picture earlier this week of a fireman in the early 1900s, and it was a new uniform that they tried out. And the uniform was basically the same fireman outfit that we normally would know, but his helmet was slightly different and it was spraying water. So the idea was that they would get soaked before they even go into the fire, because that would keep them safe. Now, for some weird reason, that did not catch on. But I, it just gave me that image of God soaking us with his love and his grace and his peace in every day. Just taking it all in, being safe, because he's, he's drenching us in his love. And I just, I absolutely love that. And I hope today you feel that God is with you, that God's around you, and that God is here. We're going to start with a hymn. And if you would join us, that would be lovely. If you can stand up. Thank you.
Thank you. You can sit down. I hope you had a brilliant week during the week and that you could exp that you experienced something of God's love during this week. For me personally, it was a busy week, along with a lot of volunteers who helped. And I want to say thank you for everybody who prayed, anyone who came along, especially the volunteers. Thank you. We've had just over 200 children this week coming through church, um, and a lot of smiles and a lot of enjoyment. So thank you so much, um, and glory to God, because it was a brilliant, brilliant week. Um, very busy, though. So thank you so much for that. Ian's asked me to remind you about the church weekend that we're having on the 18th and 19th of May. On the Saturday, there will be a session from 9 to 11, and then we're here on the Sunday. So please keep that in mind and put it in your diaries, and we hope to see you all here. We are going to do things slightly different today. We're going to do the offering now, and we're doing it as an act of worship. The band's going to play for us, I want you to do it in prayer. We're not going to join in with singing while we're, while we're doing it. I want you to really concentrate on why we're doing it. Our offering is such an important part of our worship. It's not something we do on the sideline. We can praise God with so many things in our lives and the way we act or the, the, what we give him. But our financial gifts is just as important. Important. So for today, we're going to do it slightly different. So while we take up the offering, please pray about it. Please pray that these offerings will be used to God's glory. Thank you. to honor you with these offerings that we bring you. Thank you that we can give back to you. We ask that you would use these offerings to your glory. Guide us to use it in the wisdom that we can only get from you. We ask this in your name. Amen. I'm going to read um, a few verses from Psalm 100. It's one of my favorite psalms. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. Give thanks to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good. Let's stand and worship the Lord, please. Come, now is the time.
Sunday. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Till your great treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come, now is the
That's a prayer of thanks, and I think first, thanks for the lovely day. Thank you for your constant love, Lord. We pray that we can always use our voices to thank you by singing loudly, never forgetting the amazing grace you show us every day, which we do not deserve, but are daily showered with it. You show your love in amazing ways, and we don't always take time out with you to just give simple thanks. The minute yet self-magnified complexities of life today can sometimes sully your shining light in our lives. Well, if we allowed them to. I pray that we can focus and let your light shine brightly before others. We have so much to thank you for. You are Lord, you are God, you made us, we are yours, your people, the sheep of your pasture. Lord, you've shown me so much love throughout my life, even when I ignored you and turned away from your light and filled my life with shallow pleasure. Your love filled my life. Lord, all of those walking in your life are so blessed. It is an absolute joy to witness and experience your glorious healing. Thank you, Lord. I hope these words from Philippians 4, 6-7 will soothe you as they do me. They are taken from the, <coughs> excuse me, from the Message Bible, which was gifted to me by two wonderful Christian friends. Not loved by all, but the text resonates with me. Don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good, will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the centre of your life. Our lives can be peppered with shock, loss, sad times and upset. C.S. Lewis summed it up. Though our feelings come and go, God's love for us does not. Lord, we thank you that we never walk in darkness, even though at times we feel it may envelope us. Your light is so much stronger than anything in this increasingly garish, dazzling world. I pray that we can find peace away from the world regularly to simply give thanks to you. Please spend a few moments now giving thanks and try to find time away from here to enjoy quality periods of peaceful time, expressing your thankfulness for the graceful love which surpasses knowledge. Thank you, Lord. Amen. It's time for our young people to go out with their leaders, so we just pray for them with, as they go out. God, thank you for the children and young people in our church. Thank you that you bless us with families. We ask that you be with them while they're going out into their group and just let them experience your love there. Amen. I'm reading from Exodus chapter 20. Then God gave the people all these instructions. I am the Lord your God, who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You must not have any other God but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them who worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay 
the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected. Even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. You must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest, dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. Honour your father and mother. Then you will live a long, full life in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely against your neighbour. You must not covet your neighbour's house. You must not covet your neighbour's wife, male or female servant, ox or donkey or anything else that belongs to your neighbour. Good morning. And uh, we're starting uh, this series on the Ten Commandments, and I'm not sure how you're going to approach it. I hope it's with excitement and anticipation. Um, you know, when you read them and you look at them, you think, oh, there's quite a few things in there we need to, you know, we need to make, take these seriously, but sometimes uh, maybe we don't. I'll be referring, um, certainly in my introduction, this, this week is more kind of a get you excited about what's coming. Uh, you won't be surprised now, it's a 10-week series, um, and we'll have some visiting speakers, but also our speakers as well. But I'll be referring today to two, two books, well, three books, actually. Firstly, the Bible, um, but secondly, as a book, which I'd recommend, from John Mark Comer, Practicing the Way. Um, and the one that we're giving to visiting preachers, though they're not held to it, but if you want a textbook for your small groups or anything else, is Just Ten from J. John uh, which is uh, obviously the Ten Commandments. And we're going to approach the series in the same way he does in his book. We're going to start with the last one, which will be next week, do not cover, um, and finish it on the first one, because the first one, I can't say it's the, to my eyes, it's the most important. I think they're all important, but uh, it ends with God, which is good. So I hope you're excited about it. You should be. I am. Um, as in this book, J. John describes these com commandments as God's timeless values for life today. And you may or may not think that. You might think, well, they're a bit dated. Uh, well, they are. 
but as far as I can see, nothing's beaten them yet. They still stand the, t stand the test of time. So I'm excited about them, and David kindly on the, on the um, project said, let's get started. So let's get started. So that's good. We're God's covenant people. If you're a Christian, if you believe in Christ and you trust him with your life and follow him, we're part of God's covenant people. When we come to the communion table later, it's, it's because we are people of the new covenant. We have freedom, uh, but within that freedom, God gives us his word um, as a way of life to live. And one of the most often quoted verses are the Ten Commandments. Uh, in films over Easter, I saw the, you know, the, all the old ones came back on, didn't they? And you see the Ten Commandments. We're God's covenant people. And you can approach these rules of life or ways of life in two ways. One could be, which is probably society's way, I'm not being told what to do. God just wants to spoil all the fun. And the second way is, well, no, God knows what's best for me because, after all, he's God and I'm not. And this is a way of life. He's showing me a better way. And I suppose the question this morning, do we agree with J. John? Are they timeless values or not? Is it better to have the boundaries or is it better to have a, a kind of a free-for-all? Do as you will. Um, I like football and I've had a good weekend. Um, and uh, I used to love playing football. Now that I can't quite uh, recover so well as I used to. But back in the day, you know, any piece of grass or playground, the jumpers were put down, um, you know, the corners loosely marked. You just guessed the height of the goalpost because none of us happened to take goalposts to school with us. So we had to guess the height. And, you know, you just mark it out a bit rough and ready. And then, you know, there might be 13 on one team and eight on the other. And it was chaos. Right? There was no referee, there's no linesman, there's no real rules. You could foul people and say you didn't mean it. You could have put it miles over the crossbar but say, no, 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 that was under. And honestly, we haven't got 13 in our team, we've only got 11. And so it was lying, cheating, people were injured, people got hurt. If the referee turns up, on the, when I used to play in the Saturday leagues, there were proper linesmen and referees, you could argue if you take the first few, well, that, oh, the referee's going to spoil the game. I don't want the rules. I like just being able to do whatever I want to do. And, and, and that's fine for me, but people got hurt. When the referee comes and the corner, post, corner posts are marked and we've got the goal posts and there's rules and there's ways of doing things, actually the game became more enjoyable and less people got hurt. And so as we look at these 10 way of life for us, let's look at it from that perspective. That actually, God does know what's best. They're timeless They've stood the test of time. The referee turns up with some linesmen. They introduce the rules. Everybody is better off. There are rules, discipline, fairness. You could argue whether the game's better or worse. I would say it's better. It's better, and there's freedom to follow the rules. These are timeless values, I think. And the series is not to condemn, but really to show God's great guidance over the years in living fruitful lives. And as I said, we'll work from the last commandment to the first uh, which is, you shall have no other God. So God comes first. And I'm excited, uh, as I say, I'm excited to be preaching some of them, and I'll, I'll be look, listening to the other guys as they come as well. The term Christian is only used three times in the Bible. Did you know that? You probably do, because David spoiled it and put it on the uh, email that came out, which I wish he hadn't, but there you go. On the basis you've read that email, and you've read it really closely and absorbed every word, how, can anyone tell me... How many times the word disciple is used in the Bible? More than Christian, do you think? Christian was three times. How many times do you think the word disciple is used? Have a guess. Who is that? That's very close. 269. 269 times. So the word Christian is used three times. The word disciple, 269. It's a very good, good first guess. Um, so it, it seems that God is more interested in people who actually follow him rather than somebody who just calls themselves a Christian. Um, the term Christian actually originally was used as a kind of a slur. It meant sort of little, little Christs, and it was meant as a slur. They were called then followers of the way, uh, which is the, uh, the, you know, nearly the title of this book, Practicing the Way. It's followers of the way. So that when Jesus later on says, I am the way, and he says, follow me, doesn't he? I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's what he's referring to. So as we look at these Ten Commandments, uh, I'm hoping we've discovered a purpose for us in our lives today. 
I think it's at the heart of discipleship. The word disciple uh, can be translated many ways, follower, learner, activist, student. Uh, This book would say apprentice. So it's one who learns but also puts what he learns into practice. And it's the heart of discipleship and it's about putting into practice our faith. So in this book, he says, some describe themselves as Christian while subscribing to the bare bones of discipleship. Jesus was surrounded by crowds. The challenge is not to be just a face in the crowd, but instead an apprentice of Jesus. We want to move away from that kind of salvation by minimum entry requirements. The gospel isn't a passive gospel. It's not just say your prayer or even be baptised or even come to church and then do nothing and expect to leave it all to God. Because God, as he changes us, releases us to do things for him. The Bible says we are the body of Christ. Christ acted. The body needs to act. The gospel, the good news of Christ, is not passive. In fact, Jesus said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount that everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't put them into practice is foolish. I don't want to be foolish. James says, doesn't he, faith without works is dead. What use is my faith to someone who's starving? If I say, well, that's a shame. I've got faith, they haven't. But if I feed them, that faith is alive. I'm supposed to act. The Hebrew word for disciple is a word called Talmud. It means a student and a practitioner. It means someone who learns and then puts it into practice. In those days, people followed rabbis. They spent time with them. They became like them, and they did as they did. And that is the heart of discipleship. As this guy says, to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus, and to do as Jesus did. And so it's important, isn't it, to be intentional, to say as a follower, as we approach these Ten Commandments, I'm going to put God first in everything. And the Bible says, doesn't it, seek or strive first for the kingdom. So those three things, firstly, to be, to be, so us, the rabbi, it's God, to be with God, that takes time. It means we need to be intentional. It means be committed to pray, to talk to God and to listen as he talks back, to be in his word, to come along to gatherings, get in a small group, practicing silence and solitude, listening. It's important to be with God in today's rushed society. You can help me that a bit when we come to the Sabbath teaching. And then to become, become like who? Become like Jesus. Allowing the Holy Spirit to change us. Becoming more like him. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. We're supposed to become more like Jesus in our character and our deeds. So that's to be and to become and then to do what Jesus did. It was windy last night, wasn't it? And um, I don't know if you felt that. We were away. We've sort of been over the place uh, this week. But even when I came in today, people, everyone was coming in. I go, how are you? It was windy. Isn't it? And a lot of people talked about the wind. Uh, some came on their bikes, although it was very brave. I came in the car. Um, Matthew 6, 24 says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the torrents raged, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because its foundation was on the rock, and our foundation has to be in God. Otherwise, if we're a bit whimsical and we're not sure and we've got one foot in one camp camp and one foot in the other, we can be blown around, we can be tossed astray. And Jesus goes on to say, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them is like a foolish person who built his house on sand. The rain fell, the torrents raged, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell and great was its collapse. So it's important to have our foundation in the word and in these ten rules of life. Foundations must be true and strong. The Ten Commandments are definitely part of that foundation. They're around 300 words long. They've never been improved upon. They're still relevant today. They form the the foundation of the legal systems across the Western world. Their values are indeed timeless, as J. John would testify to. And I would say you ignore them at your peril. You don't have to look at the world to see how it's going. They're found in Exodus 20, in the account where Moses was given them on Mount Sinai, and they're also found in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Summing them up, not to go through them all again, and this is the kind of introduction, I am the Lord your God, so straight away, I am. 
you know, when God was asked his name, I am. When Jesus later on uh, is, is, is asked about many things, he points to himself because he was and is God. He knew exactly what he was saying when he said, I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and life. He's saying, I am God. So when it starts off with that, I, God gets his identity in first. I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. We're not, I'm not struggling in Egypt. You're not struggling in Egypt. I don't need to be rescued from Egypt. I have no intention of going holiday to Egypt, although if I do, I would imagine EasyJet will get me back. But in those days... They were rescued from Egypt. And, but still today, God will rescue people from wherever they're held in captivity. And what I mean by that is whether it's addiction, whether it's in bad relationships, whether it's in turmoil, whatever their life is, he promises as we trust him, it might be difficult, but he will rescue us from that life of sin and discord. So he starts with that. And then verse 3, you must not have any other God but me. And this is the heart of the disciple, isn't it? God first. It's putting, what would Jesus do? Easy to wear the bracelet, harder to put into practice. So it's God first. You must not make for yourself an idol. So it's not looking to other things, it's about knowing God. You must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Think about how the, the name of Jesus Christ is used in this country. We're not doing too well as a country. Thankfully, that's not within the church, but that's the one uh, religious name, for want of a better word, that is banded about with no regard and no one blinks an eye. You must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. So that's taking God seriously. Remember to uh, observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. No burnout. I mean, people are getting... I got burnt out. I thought I knew better than God. I remember when I left my last church, they owed me about 24 days of, of, um, of days where I'd worked, where I hadn't taken my day off. I thought I knew better than God. God showed me I didn't. Ministers succumb to this, but it's a commandment. We're supposed to take a day of rest. And to say that we don't need it is to say God doesn't know what's best for me. I know what's best for me, and he'll prove us wrong. And you've all heard the, the, uh, the, uh, the excuses, I'm too busy, or it's been all go. I like that one. It's been all go, isn't it? And I think, well, go where? Not enough hours in the day. Yes, there is. Same every day. I've always know. Time's run out. I've never seen it run anywhere. It's everywhere. Where does the time go? I don't know. We've got all those things. Honour your father and mother. Then you will live a long, full life in the land the Lord your God has given you. All the parents here are going to love that one until I say it also says later somewhere else in the Bible, don't exasperate your children. You must not murder. We might think, well, I've never murdered. I doubt very much anyone in here has, has murdered. Please don't raise your hand. Um, but it's about managing anger. Jesus says if you're angry with a brother, you've committed murder in your heart. You must not commit adultery. It seems good enough for me. A fair proof of your relationships is the sermon title on that one. You must not steal. You know, you can prosper, but do it with a clear conscience. You must not testify falsely against your neighbour. So basically, don't lie. Uh, and some of the self-help books, as, as uh, Jordan Peterson, in one of his books, he had the ten... He's, a good, he's not a bad writer... And he often comes from a Christian perspective. He had ten rules for life. And one was don't lie, or at least don't mean to. It's not quite the same authority, I don't think, as the Ten Commandments. And you could say we don't lie, but if I, I'll roll out a, a few. The checks in the post, that was the old one. I don't know if any of you write any checks anymore, but that was the one that people used to say. Um, this, is, this is a bad one, which might apply to a few of you. It applies to me. I'll start my diet tomorrow. Or I don't remember you saying that. The quest this questionnaire, when you're down Lee, Lee High Street, it will only take two minutes. They're lying. <laughs> Open wide, this won't hurt. Liar. <laughs> Don't bear false testimony. You must not cover. And we've called that one finding true contentment. And you've heard the sayings there as well, haven't you? Grass is always greener on the other side. And the famous response is, Don't worry about that, water your own. Our year this is a good one. Our yearnings exceed our earnings. God made us a little lower than the angels, but we want to climb higher than the Joneses. To be content in life, to have real contentment, is really don't, don't cover what everyone else has got. Be really pleased and feel blessed for what you've already got. These verses for many generations, they didn't need to be defended. They made sense. And actually, when you read them, what, what would you argue with? You know, no, no, I think it's wrong. I think I should murder or commit adultery. You know, it, it makes no sense. that they're, they're good laws... 
and they're there because the referee, God, wants us in the game, but he wants us to enjoy it, and he doesn't want anybody to get hurt. They made sense. But the problem now is that for at least one generation, possibly two, they won't even know them. They don't even know them. Sometimes churches that don't teach or live by them. Their message has been lost, and people think they can find a better way. People think they can improve on them. But if you have a look around, and as a nation has increasingly turned its back on God, how do you think we're doing? It's not working. And actually, um, some of the surveys are showing it's younger people that are looking for more direction. We think we've got to bend to the point of breaking. But actually, they want structure. They need structure. And without it, they're going down the wrong roads. There's moral decline. People will say anything goes. There's confusion. You know, there's dating apps now that you can go... I oh, shouldn't... I don't know. I'm not gonna, you know, people can have affairs by going on dating apps and have security things so no one can check on them. How can that be right? Drug and alcohol abuse through the roof. Depression is rife. Racial tension is apparent. And as society has walked away from God, chaos takes its place. And I look at our country and I think sometimes it's chaotic. And I read things and I say, that makes no sense. It's up to us to pull people back to God. The referee has gone, the game is ruined, people are getting hurt, they think it's better, they're wrong. Tolerance is the key word, except when it comes to Christianity. We're in a mess and the church needs to regain her prophetic voice. The salt and light into the decay and darkness, calling people back to God. As we saw in those baptisms last week, people say, no, I'm going to commit to Christ. I want to be a disciple. I want to follow. God has spoken and it makes sense to listen to him. And so I'd suggest you, as you take on this series, be ready, be, be willing to be challenged, be willing to commit afresh. Don't be an onlooker, the face in the crowd that Jesus would have seen. Be a disciple. Be an apprentice. Resolve to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus, and to do as Jesus did. And he gave us our standing orders at the end of Matthew's Gospel. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. And in Luke chapter 9, then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple, didn't say Christian or convert, he said whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. That's what the apprentices did. They followed their rabbi. They spent time with their rabbi. They got to know their rabbi. They did what the rabbi did. They learned from him. They, we must be followers of Christ. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet lose or forfeit their very self? And as we go through this series, let's be intentional to listen and to learn and to put those words into practice. Some of the questions that I've sent out for the small groups, but you can be thinking about these or even join a small group. You know, how committed are you going to say this morning, I'm going to be to these verses? As we go through the service, uh, services, how committed are you going to be? How seriously are we going to take, take each and every one of them? Do you really feel they're not relevant for today? Are there any that you struggle with? If so, get prayer. Get alongside someone. Ask them to help. It's the heart of discipleship to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus, and to do what Jesus did. Are we good at some and not so good at others? What enabled Jesus? What nourished Jesus? What empowered Jesus? Think about his life, his prayer life, his, his knowledge of God's word, the times he sought solitude, times he fasted, seeking the Father. If he did that and, he's, and we're apprentices, then shouldn't we? And of course, then he put his faith into action. And the church is to do as Jesus did. He's given us our standing orders in the Great Commission I just read to you. He has the authority, so you're never on your own. He's standing right there with you, but he tells us, our standing orders, go and make disciples. There's that word again. Not Christians, not converts. Make disciples, followers of the way. Baptise them like we did last week and teach them. He's with us always. So will you recommit this morning as we take communion in your small groups? Faith in action. 
be intentional, think about how you're going to do that. Think about, I really want to commit to this. What am I going to change in my life to help me? We had a small group meeting uh, on Wednesday, and one of the things that came up, someone said, it'd be great if I had a little card to put in my purse or wallet, and I thought, that was, that was a good idea. And so um, I spoke to David, and he's, he's produced these. Mine's a little bit bent up now, because it's been in my pocket. But the Ten Commandments are on the back in the sermon titles that we've given, and we've got loads of them at the back, so please take one as you go. But stick it on the fridge or your mirror or wherever you're going to see it. Put it in your purse, wallet, wherever. But maybe just ponder on them. And as we go through the series, pray them through and see what you're going to change in your life. This is God's Word. These are not just some rules that were written thousands of years ago that we can take it or leave it. If we're going to take God seriously, let's take his word seriously. And remember, uh, be intentional. Really pray about them. As we come to communion, maybe recommit. Maybe it's your first commitment, but rely on God. And as you try and work these out in your lives, as you try and do the right thing, I don't know if you've noticed this, there's always people around who say, oh, no, don't do that, no, come on. You can and they try, you know, maybe steer you down the wrong way. Some, some will even be against you. But we're going to sing uh, a song, Raise a Hallelujah. You know, let my faith be louder than the unbelief that's out there. Let my, my weapon is the melodies. We sing these songs as we praise in spite of things. That's our weapon. And you may face pressure, but in the chorus, the king is alive. The king is, is alive. And when you face that kind of, um, you know, when you're trying to do the right thing and, and things come against you, it says, heaven comes to fight for me. You are not alone. The Bible says a great multitude of witnesses cheering you on as you go out into the world and show the world that their way is not working. God's way works because he is God and he created you and he created them. So let me pray for us and then we'll stand and sing our raise a hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your word. And as we go through this series, I pray, Lord, we'll get a fresh understanding with the various people coming in to preach it I pray, Lord, they'll bring a prophetic voice to us and that we'd be encouraged as your covenant people to really take your word seriously and to live it out. Forgive us where we've maybe been a bit haphazard, and I count myself in that on some of these. You'll show us that your ways are best. We pray, Lord, that we'll see you more than just a referee on a football pitch, but the God of all ages who came to rescue us from whatever our Egypt was rescues us out of the pit and the slime and the muck and actually puts us on the path of life that is yours and ends with you. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.
Part of being a follower, an apprentice, a disciple of Christ is to do the things that he asked us to do. And one of the things that he asked us to do was this. He said, do this in remembrance of me. And so this is why one of the reasons why we do it. It's instigated by Christ. It's one of our sacraments, a place where God promises to meet with us. It commemorates the death of Christ. We're doing that when he said, do this in remembrance of me. Signifies, seals and applies to believers all the benefits of the new covenant. We're not held under the old covenant. In this ordinance, Christ ratifies his promise to his people. And us, on our part, we solemnly, and we do solemnly, consecrate, consecrate ourselves to him and to his entire service. You know, when we get baptised, when we saw those eight people get baptised last week, it's often seen as, as it, well, it is a response to what's already happened, but it's often, that's, that's the initiatory theological right. That's the first, it's a one-off event, you know, and uh, it's why Nicodemus said to Jesus in John 3, well, how can a man be born again? Does he re-enter the mother's womb? It's not about that. You can only be born once, and then you get born spiritually. When you're born as a believer, you get baptised, that's the one-off event. We don't baptise again and again and again and again and again the same person. That's the birth. This is the ongoing, this is the ongoing sacrament that we have in Baptist churches. This is the thing we do often. So one's initiatory, one's ongoing, and we consecrate ourselves to Christ in his church, to his service. He also indicates and reminds us that we're in communion with ourselves here in Christ, but the church worldwide all the believers in Christ. It's a mutual communion with believers, with each other. And it's a reminder that we're brothers and sisters because what God has done. And Paul recounts this in 1 Corinthians 11. And he wrote, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's important we come in the right heart. The passage goes on to say, so then, whoever eats this bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. So it's serious. And it means that we recognise that we, we're not perfect. We do get things wrong. But Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save it. He came to seek and save the lost, rescue us out of our Egypt. And so it's not, these words are not meant to condemn us, but they are meant to for us to take this seriously. So let's just spend just a short while just bringing those things that you know you need to bring before God. And be assured that he's a forgiving God. There is no condemnation now for those in Christ Jesus. 
He knows what you've done. He knows what you do. He knows what you think. That's why Jesus came, to pay a price. So we do lots of good, and sometimes we're not so good. So bring those things before the Lord in confidence. Run towards the Father who longs to hear you, longs to forgive. Lord, we thank you for this sacrament, this sacred moment. We thank you that it reminds me of just how much you love the world. So we'd want to say to you this morning as your people, people of the new covenant, that we don't take this lightly. That it cost you everything. And you was willing to do that for each individual here. So as we take the bread and the wine, Lord, we're reminded of your love and your forgiveness. As we prayed our prayers, I pray, Lord, that people here would know absolute that love and forgiveness, that they've been redeemed, they've been bought at a price. That's how much value they are to you. So as we take the bread and the wine, we give you thanks for it and what they represent, your body and blood. And I pray, Lord, that as a fellowship of believers here, we'd once again feel your presence and you'd fill us with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So Handy's going to come and help me and I'll serve the bread. Um, And you can eat that whenever you feel ready. Uh, Maybe retain the cups and we'll drink together as brothers and sisters at the end. If you're not a follower of Jesus, you're not a disciple, you haven't put your trust in him yet, then please uh, don't worry. If you want to come forward for a blessing, you can do that. But please speak to us, uh, because we know that God is reaching out to you. So if the stewards can direct people, that would be great. The bread is all gluten-free, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, So just come up and let us serve you.
we can drink together as people of the new covenant. God bless. Lord, at this time we just want to lift all those people that we've named on the update, those in our prayers, those that are suffering, those that are rejoicing. Do pray particularly for those who have been sick and unwell, battling many things. For those that are bereaved and are mourning. Pray you'll send your peace, comfort and healing to them. Help us as brothers and sisters, Holy Spirit, prompt us during the week when those people need to be prayed for specifically. Put their faces and their names into our minds and guide us. Help us to remember that sometimes we're the answer to our own prayers. We can help, comfort and love and support. We lift all of those people up to you, Lord. We thank you for them. Pray your peace over them. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's praise God with our next hymn. Sit down, thank you. I just want to remind you of our little cards at the back. Please make sure you take one. Um, it's a, a good reminder of what we're doing for the next 10 weeks, and you can pray through it as well. 
I want to finish this service with the words of a song that I normally go to when life just gets really, really busy. And it's called Be Still. It's so loud, I just can't seem to slow this down. I need you more than ever now. Let the silence be the only sound. Your glory becomes the only thing I see. Your beauty brings me to my knees. The awe that you inspire in me. So now I stand before you, broken down, my feet upon this holy ground. I can feel your presence all around. It makes me want to be still, so still you can hear me breathing in, so still you can hear me breathing out. Let your calm descend upon me now. As we take our worship, our praise and our prayer out into the world and into our daily lives, may our lives be sustained through the love of our Heavenly Father. May we feel the presence of our Savior walking beside us and know the power of the Spirit in both our actions and words. May we be drenched in God's love and grace and peace during this week. May you bless you all. Amen.